circumzenophil arc. It's a small one, but you can see it up there. That's the anvil of a big one pretty sail passing through. More anvil tops in the distance out west. Hello everyone. Just uh, heading out in a photo shoot tonight. Thought I'd do a quick vlog about the event. Um, nothing exceptional is happening tonight. Normally when we head out on a shoot, I meet up, I either go on my own or meet up with some of the guys and we do a bit of filming or time lapse and usually we have a, a specific reason for being there. Whether it be time lapse photography, star trails, aurora, moonlit landscape photography, or meteor shower even or some other celestial event going on. So normally we have a specific reason for going there. But the weather has been, this has been the worst autumn I've ever seen in Northern Ireland. It's been cloudy in so many nights. A lot of grey skies day and night with very few actual proper clear nights for quite some time. So this is Friday, Friday the 26th of November, or sorry, October, way ahead of myself. October and again close to Halloween and tonight it's showing clear skies. So that's our excuse. It's been a while since we've been out, so I'm planning to hook up with the guys. Um, uh, Paul Martin from Oma possibly will be coming up, hopefully later on. Uh, meeting John Fagan from Dungannon and I'm also meeting Nigel McFarland from the Little Valley area. So that's at least three of us that I know of. So I'll be meeting them up at the north coast at the Ballantoy area. That's that's the basic plan and anyway, it's the rendezvous point. So what what's this all about? Well, it's a clear sky, sort of. That's also weather related. We're actually being affected by our first Arctic air mass of the season. Polar air has just descended down last night and it's going to last for a couple of days and nights but tonight is uh, the most potent of, of the last couple. Really really cold Arctic air descending across the ocean. And here's the interesting part. The cold air overspreading the warmer sea creates instability. So you get that cold air aloft and warmer moist air at the surface and that creates lift. So air parcels ascend, they call that convection. So we're expecting convection to take place, convective showers and cells. The cape is not exceptional, it's fairly low. Uh, Nightland was our charter shown surface based cape of around 100 joules per kilogram. But some of the other charts are shown far less than that. Anyhow, there will be instability, there will be convective showers over the sea moving in and out normally flow and hitting the north coast. So that's the main, one of the main reasons for us going. The moon will be up tonight, it's probably be three days after full phase, so it'll be bright and high and it'll be illuminating these cells for us, making them easily visible uh, along the coastline and over the ocean. So the, the idea of this photography trip is to capture moonlit cells on camera with stars. If the if we do it earlier in the evening when the moon is lower, we might might even get a uh, potential for moon bows. And we're also hoping to shoot general starscapes if the gaps between these showers are clear enough. Um, but the there's a lot of ifs and buts of this whole setup. There may not be that many gaps between showers, but we know it could be a cloud fest. We'll have to take that chance because it is an Arctic air mass. And we're hoping for some clear sky. And on the other hand, we still have the cells to shoot. We may have stars to shoot. The, we're also entering an interesting phase in autumn here between meteor showers. There's a, the Ryanids have just passed and there are several minor showers present, but at the minute there's a very long duration event called uh, the Torrid Meteor Shower, related to the Torrid Meteor Complex, Meteoroid Complex rather. Um, they're notorious for producing fireballs. Uh, the meteor shower is very spread out over a long period of time. There's actually the Northern and Southern Torrids active both of which are very low rates per hour. They're not a spectacular meter shower, but they are brilliant for fireballs. At random, I don't know where you could get a brilliant fireball. A fireball is any meteor brighter than planet Venus, which is about magnitude minus 4.7, give or take. And on occasion, these fireballs can surpass the brightness of the moon and cast shadows. And on even rare occasions, they even produce audio sound effects, which I've heard in the past, which are incredible. So that's the idea, moonlit convection. Starscapes, moonlit landscapes, um, possibility of a torrid random fireball, which would be just more luck than anything else. And also a good chance for us guys to meet up and have a, a, a chat and chat about all things sky and photography related and have a good night in the process. So, but it's gonna be nasty. 
charter so uh, wouldn't cost anywhere between 20 and 30 plus miles per hour coming straight off the, the Arctic, hitting the north coast, nothing stopping them. It's going to be brutal. A very nasty wind chill, and some of these showers will be uh, packing strong squalls associated with them, which uh, could lead to very enhanced, brief localised wind gusts, very strong in that area. So, will, will, be, will we be even able to do photography? I don't know. There's certainly been no time lapse in anyway, but the idea is we'll try to take shelter, we'll pop in and out of the vehicles and out of strategic areas and get single exposures back in again and hope we catch something cool. It's, it's a bit of fun, it's an adventure and an excuse to get out around nature, so that's the plan anyway. There's also a slight chance in the way home the temperatures will drop enough for some of these showers to produce hail, sleet and maybe even a slight bit of hill snow on the high ground. That actually happened last night over Donegal and parts of the spur and it's very briefly so we got our first snow of the season even though i didn't see it it was visible on radar and i see him again tonight into tomorrow morning so that's the game plan anyway uh the battery's not good in this gopro but i'll try to do a bit of filming later on record us some of the guys talking and capture the moment it'll be very hard to film at night but this is just an experiment for a bit of fun and hopefully they get a few images also before going any further thought i would uh, inform you about something i'm working on at the minute As many of you may know if you've been following me for a while, I've been highly involved in astronomy for a long time, perhaps 20 years or so. I'm currently working on an e-book about observing comets. In fact, this is the, the cover of it now. Since it's load. Um, there's a comet become visible in December, actually mid-November, right through December, it's moving into the Northern Hemisphere soon. It's called Comet 46P Vertanen, a short period of comet. This one, I've actually observed it 10 years ago in my 8-inch. It was about 9th magnitude at the time, just a faint smudge. Well, this time it's going to be a lot closer to the Earth, possibly as close as uh, somewhere along the order of 30 lunar distances. So it may become naked eye during the middle of December and be... Uh, visible as a large green fuzzy tailless possibly tailless comet in the middle of uh, Taurus which should be interesting something to shoot and observe and run up to Christmas but uh, because of that I've decided to launch this ebook uh, I've been working on it for about six weeks at, at the moment I've just finished the current draft and at the minute it's been proofread it's really about observing comets and how to track them down in the sky and it'll brief it about my own history how I get interested in comets and it features heavily about a, a visual observation, recording your observation in a logbook and sketches. The, the book is full of my sketches of comets over the years and extracts from my German log, logbooks about comets. So it's, it's very specific and very personal. So if anyone's interested in that, I'm going to have it available for sale at a very reasonable price in the near future, as soon as I get a few. Quick look at the kit bag. Uh, I've had this kit bag for years. I've had the kit for years. Nothing has been upgraded. Um, I'm the kind of person that likes to stick with equipment for as long as possible and get the very best out of it and use it and use it and use it until it starts to deteriorate or I'm not happy with it. And then I will move on. So I've always been a believer that at the end of the day, but technology is important. Good gear is very important. And looking after it is very important. But at the end of the day, it's the person behind the camera that makes the difference. If you don't have that dedication, that passion, or that creativity to be out there with the camera, you're not going to get good images. You can have the best camera in the world. If you're not out, if you don't have the mindset behind it to the passion, it's just not going to work, is it? So, anyway, enough of my blathering. This is my 600D, just a quick run through. 600D, which is my main artillery. As on it, I have a Samyang 10mm f2.8 lens. I have a battery grip underneath it with two batteries. I, I find this is actually a really good setup with both these batteries in it. I've never run out of battery on a single night shooting at all, and that's shooting time lapse or star trails for much of the night. So it's really, really good. And I haven't changed those batteries in years. Very reliable, quite impressed. Uh, of course, this is the 1.6 crop sensor camera. It's probably like a dinosaur now compared to some other people's cameras that, that they use. Uh, the reason is that the, although it was great, it's still a great camera and it was good in its day. But it's a 1.6 crop sensor and the sensor uh, doesn't handle noise very well compared to modern day cameras. I can't go any higher than ISO 1600, even though it allows me to, but the noise is just too much. So that's my only reliable threshold is 1600 ISO. That's fine, I get by on it on most occasions. 
So that's my main artillery, wide angle lens, we're using that tonight. Also have the 50mm f1.8 lens, actually a personal favourite of mine. This is a superb lens. I know a lot of daytime photographers like to use this for portraiture, various other things, but it's a fantastic nighttime lens. Collects a lot of light very quickly. You can even get the, uh, is it? It's just an f1.8. Well, uh, this is the f1.8 version. You get an f1.4 1.4 as well, but very fast, very reliable, very uh, easily knocked out of focus. If you nudge the tripod at all or bang into it, it would actually slip out of focus very quickly. So you have to be very precise with your focus and careful. But once it is focused, it's a superb lens. Very good for uh, selecting areas of the sky you want to focus on, like the aurora, to collect a lot of detail very quickly. Uh, also good for bright comets as well, and various other astronomical phenomena. So uh, yeah, good good lens. Uh, also have the standard 18 to 55 kit lens. Uh, of course, everyone nobody likes a kit lens. This is okay. It's got me great results over the years, especially before I upgraded to the wide angles. It's just a little bit slow, but having said that, it's still good, and I I like the I like the way uh, I like the actual. I don't know how to describe it, but I just like the look of the images from it. It's just a pity the these lenses tend to be a bit softer in the edges. Uh, interferometer. Use this for daytime time lapses for storms. I don't really use it at night because I have another cable release in here specifically for that. That's for daytime. A head torch, good rechargeable head torch. This one's actually quite expensive, but it's lasted me for years. It's currently playing up at the minute with a loose connection, but it still works. So actually I might just double charge that up before I go, just in case. And here's my problem. This is a problem. This is the awesome Canon uh, 24 to 70 millimeter f 2.8 lens very fast lens great optics very well made lens heavy this is a proper lens problem is uh, it's playing up on my camera at the minute my dslr doesn't recognize it when i put it on i get a black screen the mirror uh, flops down and i get an error on the screen it seems to be to do with the connection in here at the back so uh I can't rely on it at all. It's actually a dead weight. I might just leave it behind the night to save me weight in the bag because it just does not work. I might need to get it uh, sent away, but I'm not too sure I'm keen on that. Uh, I'll see. I'll see. I'll figure something out. So that's pretty much it. This kit lens. I've uh, got some really heavy duty. Uh, it's going to be freezing the night, actually, at Baltic. I'm going to be layered up in thermals. Uh, i got a land, actually, this coat off my dad. He uses this out in the, the ocean in their boats. Very, very good windproof wet proof jacket i've got a thermal suit on hanging in the wardrobe upstairs and i have various thermal layers which i'm going to be putting on uh, also here's my drone as well the phantom 3 advanced I actually just had everything charged up on it there today uh wasn't too strong today but tomorrow morning there's a very small chance of snow in the hills if there's anything significant worth filming at least it's ready it's charged and i might head up and film but at least I like to have a charge all the time and ready, even if conditions don't look suitable, just in case things suddenly change or something spectacular presents itself. More on that later, some talking to you about the drone. Okay, before I go, I thought I'd show you my range of cameras I've used over the years. Uh, just for a little bit of history and a bit of fun, now that I'm in reflective mood. My first ever camera was a 1 million pixel point and shoot, which I actually succeeded to get my first NLC shots from. And one Christmas, I got this as a present. My first ever digital, digital camera, a proper one. Back in the day, this was the Fujifilm Finepix. 5.2 million pixels. Just a point and shoot. But it was this camera that got me started big time into photography. With it, I, was, I shot a lot of sunsets, atmospheric optics displays, sun pillars, halos. Uh, it only has a... See, it only has a two second exposure, actually called night mode. And with that, I took my first images of the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle. Even did long meteor patrols, taking two second exposures constantly for a long time until the battery went dead, hoping to get a meteor. I also shot my first half decent NLC displays with this camera, so there's a lot of sentimental value with it. But I actually broke it one day leaning out my bedroom window to shoot a st stunning stormy sunset sky. I'd I didn't have the wrist, the wrist uh, strap around my around me, and I dropped it, and it fell two stories to the ground, and smashed, and that was the end of that. 
I actually almost cried over that at the time because I loved it so much. But then that was the reason for upgrading to a new one. Then I got the next Christmas the Fuji the Fuji Fulham bridge camera. This is the old S5600, 5.2 megapixels and 10 optical zoom. Actually, for its time, it was pretty good. The only problem was it was quite noisy at the higher ISOs, but other than that, it had all the functions of a DSLR, and the zoom was excellent on it. I used this for a lot for storm photography and on my first half decent night shots, and picked up the Aurora too quite a few times in this. So yeah, that really got me grounded into the world of uh, manual photography. Then I upgraded to the next Fuji model, which I paid for this one myself. This was the uh, Fujifilm S6500. It's an upgrade in the previous model. Uh, I think it's the same. There's 6.3 megapixels. A 10 optical zoom and about 5 digital zoom. But the lens is a lot bigger in this one. It collects a lot more light. It's an F, is it? f2.8 lens when it's wide open so it's a lot faster than the older model so I did most of my astrophotography with this one a lot of planet conjunctions, aurora, NLCs, just about everything I'm interested in and I've done it very very well actually a very good camera, even comets as well but again uh, when you get to the higher ISO 1600 it is quite noisy and the sensor is not that big on it but for its day and for its time it served me very well so I have a, a lot of sentimental value with this camera uh, it doesn't work anymore. It actually packed in on me one night during the severe winter of 2010. That evening I was out shooting a gorgeous uh, conjunction and occultation of the crescent moon and planet Venus. And I think Jupiter was there too. A triple conjunction in the evening sky and it was absolutely bitterly cold. I walked for miles into the countryside went into this field to make a good view across the town. Severe frost, I mean raging cold, really just freezing. And the camera packed in on me. Just stopped working, that was it. No idea what happened. I, I don't know if it was a cold or not, but it ceased to work. But I still hold on to it for the memory because uh, it definitely is sentimental. And then I upgraded my first serious camera. This was the Canon 400D, or as they call it in the States, is an American version, the uh, uh, Rebel XSI. Uh, this is, uh, I think, this is, is it 10 or 12 million pixels. I did most of my. Well, some of my most favourite images I've ever taken were with this camera. Uh, it might actually still work, I just need a new battery for it. But uh, that's the kit lens on it, but yeah, great camera. Great for its time. Uh, it's the first camera I had with live view on it as well, which was a saving grace. I don't know how we coped <laughs> years ago without live view, trying to focus manually but on stars at night. But a uh, great camera. Uh, some of my most favourite images I've ever taken are with this, including the Giants Causeway Aurora. And some of my best storm images were taken with this camera. Really love it. Might actually get a battery for this and put it back in action again. I could put it for uh, I could use it for time lapse photography. And then to the present day, it's my 600D. That's no battery grip on it there. Uh, that's what I'm currently using at the minute. So quite a few cameras over the years, not including the older one I had, an old black one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six cameras, and I hope at some stage upgrade in the future to a full frame camera. So I can specialise more in astrophotography, low light performance, or else mirror this, but I think it'll be full frame. But anyway, I'm just uh, killing time here. The sky is lovely and clear outside, blue sky sunshine, some passing cumulus clouds. It's still bitterly cold, wind out there. I'm just waiting uh, to get something to eat, pack the gear, sort a few things out here from the guys, then organise our trip and hit the coast later and see what happens then. Okay, we're now on location. Bit of a delay with the driving, slow drivers, but we made it on location anyway. We're actually inside a cave right now. 
don't know if you can see it, the GoPro at night, but we're in Santa Cave of Ballantoy Harbour. The guys are here. We're shooting some convection. They come in there in the North Flow. A lot of hail. We're hunting for minbows, but no luck so far. But we've got some nice uh, short exposures there in the moonlight. Really, really nice seascapes, landscapes. So that's the start. And anyway, we're probably going to take a break, stay out of the strong ones, uh, get a snack, and then get back out again for the next round. It's actually really cool in here. Look at the top of the cave. Reflection. Down the Giant's Causeway now, I don't know if you can hear me with the, the wind here, but there's strong wind blasting on shore and hail showers. Come down here at the bottom of the famous 50 million year old basalt volcanic rocks. Down at the very bottom, the tide's starting to go out. This side of it, the uh, western side, is covered in foam in the stormy sea. So I'm taking exposures up in here now. Uh, the moonlight is illuminating the, the foam. Clouds are blowing by, and uh, doing short exposures here. It's turned out quite nice actually, so I might actually shoot a short time lapse here. But here's what it looks like on the screen. Well, everyone, it's the next morning. Excuse me, just having a coffee here. I got home about 3.30 in the morning. I think I had to sleep to about half four after that. It was a good enough night and I enjoyed it. Uh, we got some moonlit convection, which is convective clouds over the ocean. Uh, moonlit coastal scapes kind of thing. Good crack. We're in the a cave at one point having a barbecue, which was class. Nigel, to thank for that one. Cheers, Nigel. So we had a barbecue, tea, snacks, hiked along the coast, did a bit of shooting either side of the harbour, and then round to the Giants Causeway, did some shooting there. And it was good fun. It was kind of a night where you know you weren't really anticipating anything exceptional happening, but the fact that there was a chance of something in the spark department, and even just some landscape shots. Nighttime landscapes just made it worthwhile, just a chance to get out and shoot and take advantage of a clear night. But uh, the moon was so bright, it was three days after a full, that uh, whenever I was shooting ISO 1600, my exposures were around the seven second mark. And with the moon that bright, and landscape that bright at night, they tend to look quite flat. So whenever I was around the Giant's Causeway, I found a nice angle low down to the left of the famous rocks, which were covered in sea foam from strong winds earlier, almost looked like snow in the moonlight. So I stopped the aperture down about two or three clicks, I dropped the ISO to 800 and did long exposure. I think it was around the 40, 45 second mark. Definitely came out a lot nicer. I picked up more motion in the clouds, there was more contrast, sharpness to the frame, more depth. So I kind of liked that one. So I'll get editing them today, put a few up in the video here. you already seen them by now I'm sure if you watched this video all the way through. Also some snow reports this morning, nothing exceptional, I haven't seen any myself, but there's been some snow falling over the Sparrows and uh, 
down south as well and Eng England got really good actually they get a really good snowfall but that's really it I hope you enjoyed it uh, it was a bit uh, I should have done more filming during the middle of the night to fill in the gaps but there it was well it was very dark very windy very hard to hear anyway challenging conditions luckily we we're wrapped up well and thermal because that was a very cold wind chill last night that was really in some parts it was quite nasty but we done a good job we enjoyed it we're really good to be out around nature again so we'll get an hour night out soon and maybe doing our own these vlogs at some stage and try to do it uh, a little more detailed and document the middle of the night so thanks for watching something a bit different anyway in the meantime cheers